and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and joining me, as always, he's the golden ratio of podcasting himself. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? I am doing 1.618 times better than I was last week. That's great. I love it. Um, Fibonacci. Yep. <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. I don't know math. I'm not a math guy. It's it's all just spirals, Scott. It's just spirals. <laughs> this week on the show, we are beginning our newest deconstructing director series where we look at a director and watch all of their movies and talk about them. It's not that complicated, but we're doing it again. Uh, we'll be over the next few months watching and discussing the films of Mr. Darren Aronofsky. This week, we have Aronofsky's very first feature film, 1998's Pi, which if you are a longtime listener of this podcast, you will know we've already done an episode on this movie, um, but we're going to do it again. And we're going to spend more attention on the directing, ideally. Yeah, <laughs> I hope. I hope so. That's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of the reason why we do these, but you know, anything could happen. Anything could happen. Uh, then after that, we have to discuss the results of last week's canon vote on the movie Poltergeist, see how the vote turned out, and what, and look at the comments we got on it. So uh, so that's the show. That's what we're planning on doing here. Sounds good. All right, Matt, let's get into Mr. Darren Aronofsky. So uh, Aronofsky is a filmmaker that uh, I, I really love. I think you like him a lot, too, although I think I've seen more films uh, of his than you have. Uh, he's He's directed eight feature films over the course of his career so far, five of which are uh, movies that he also has a writing credit on. So he is kind of the the writer director, but he's not as like pure of a writer director as some of them are. Like obviously he's gone, done the director for higher thing um, for, for some of these movies, uh, but not all of them, not the one we're talking about today either. Yes. Um, Aronofsky was born February 12th, 1969 in Brooklyn, New York. He was the son of two teachers. And uh, I think this perhaps is just a great example of how much the world has changed uh, because he went to Harvard Uh and he's a son of two teachers. Like when I was reading about him, I was like, oh, he went to Harvard or he he majored in social anthropology. He did a backpacking trip through Europe. uh, And also he like did a side major in film and then eventually got his MFA from the AFI Conservatory, one of the best film schools in the country. I'd be like, oh, he must have super rich parents. I was like, no, no, just a couple of public education teachers. Uh I do feel like the past was a, a foreign country. This, this kind of reminds <laughs> me of Steve Jobs, like majoring in like fonts and then going on to, you know, b- backpack through India and then going yeah. on to found Apple and become mm-hmm. one of the most influential people of all time. Yeah. Yeah. So Aronofsky is an interesting director, Matt, in that I think he has a very unique style. Like I feel like an like you can you can take an Aronofsky film and like sometimes very clearly see his influences, but also I feel like you can take any Aronofsky film and show it to someone and they would immediately recognize it as an Aronofsky film. We're going to talk about pie here in a, in a couple minutes. It, it's just like so evident immediately that this is the same guy that directed Requiem for a dream, the same guy that directed the fountain, the same guy that directed black Swan. It's just like, it's, it, he has a very, very unique sense of filmmaking like it's it's not that the his movies all have the same tone or themes or ideas i think they're all very different movies but um stylistically you can tell an aronofsky film i think what do you think yeah i I think so i mean i think a lot of it to me has to do with an interest in certain kinds of stories too which is another Mm -hmm. thing we've observed from previous deconstructing director series where sure um just the, the director seems interested in certain plot or, or, or dramatic elements, you know, I mean, it's like, and, and I'm not the first to observe this, but I think we can say, I can easily say just from the movies of his that I have watched that he's very interested in the idea of obsession. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you could say addiction. I think, you know, this movie has so many similarities to black Swan, which is a movie that's you know five movies from now down the list, yeah. but it doesn't feel like, you know, the, the, there's they're still extremely different movies, right? But but at the same time, and, and and they feel different. They're tonally different. The character struggles are different, but also they're similarly about 
monomaniacal obsession and, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of giving everything to an obsession. Um, And I think the fountain is about that too. Um, I think the wrestler is kind of about that too. I think, I think you're right. There's a lot, there's a lot here uh, with that idea. So I guess I didn't actually read the name of the movies that we're going to be covering in this series. So, so just for everyone listening at home, the eight movies we're going to be covering in the series are Pi, Requiem for a Dream, The Fountain, The Wrestler, Black Swan, Noah, Mother, and The Whale. I hope you do I'm, that every I'm gonna, time. I'm going to do it every time, Matt. Every time. I hope you're ready. I am ready. So I have seen seven of these eight films. I've seen everything up until The Whale, which was a film that was just released last year. Uh, which of these have you not seen, Matt? I've not seen The Wrestler. Okay. Um, I've not seen Mother. And I have not seen The Whale either. And I'm actually not sure whether I've seen Noah. Um, is that the one with Russell Crowe? That is the Russell Crowe one. Then I have seen it. But I sort of don't want to give myself credit because I feel like I wasn't paying attention because I the reason I say that is I just like cannot remember a single image of the movie. But like I know, <laughs> I know that I like put it on, you know, um, this is it's probably a movie that I watched like when I had a little kid. And so I was just super distracted, and et cetera. Yeah, that's fair. I, I also have seen Noah and also don't remember very much about it. So I'm. Looking forward to revisiting that one. The only thing I remember is it has like very gnarly classical interpretations of the Old Testament Mm -hmm. in that like very mythol. It's like taking the story of of Noah and truly like making it myth um, with some like I think there are like rock monsters or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Some crazy shit goes down in that movie. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I I. I feel like that's like his least well-regarded movie out, out of a career of generally very, very, very well-regarded movies. Um, so I'm actually kind of curious <laughs> what we find yeah. when we when we do end up watching that one. His career is really interesting because, you know, he he's he's successful. Obviously, he's been able to make eight films, and his films have always, always been pretty pretty critically acclaimed. With yeah, with the exception of Noah, um, they they I don't think he's ever been like a huge financial success. Um. Like I think all these movies did well, but they never like broke out. I think I have to look this up. I need to check. I think Black Swan might be just the the most earningest of his films, uh-huh. um, and that's still like like a very specific kind of um, not going to appeal to four quadrant film. Yeah, right. Which is which is interesting, you know. Like we, I think I feel like in the deconstructing director series in the past, we've covered some pretty successful filmmakers. Like I think we did James Cameron and then Ridley Scott, which are just not only huge filmmakers who have made a lot of movies, but are very monetarily successful. And it, and I'm not saying that Aronofsky is not. It's just like he's never been the kind of I'm going to make a blockbuster film filmmaker. Right. Yeah, that's that's true. That's really interesting. Um, Maybe we'll we'll dig into more about why why that is uh, as we go through this series. Yeah, yeah. I also think he is really interested in religion. Like uh, you can tell with Pi, I think um, Noah, obviously, um, and Mother. In some ways, we'll get into when we get to that that story. Um, it's interesting because he's Jewish, uh, but he describes himself as like not a not a practicing right. They're they're Jewish culturally, and not really. They weren't like they they did like the big holidays, but. Uh, uh-huh didn't didn't like go to go to temple or, or do anything like that pretty regularly so okay um, curious about religion interested in religion but not not an active part of his his life it seems like all right something to keep in mind for sure yeah definitely especially moving into this week's film uh which is our first one so let's do it matt let's talk all about aronofsky's pie we state my assumptions one mathematics is the language of nature two Everything around us can be represented and understood through numbers. Three, if you graph the numbers of any system, patterns emerge. Therefore, there are patterns everywhere in nature. His discovery will uncover truths we cannot understand. It's a code sent to us from God. Unravel mysteries we thought were impossible. This is insanity, Max. Or maybe it's genius. And unleash an evil we never expected. You are only a vessel from our God. You are carrying a delivery that was meant for us. It was given to me. Matt, what is this movie all about? Uh, A paranoid mathematician searches for a key number that will unlock the universal patterns found in nature. 
This movie was written by Darren Aronofsky, Sean Gallette, and Eric Watson. It is, of course, directed by Aronofsky and stars Sean Gallette, Mark Margolis, and Ben Shankman. Uh, this is a movie, Matt, that cost sixty thousand dollars. Uh huh. Total. Uh, that's how much money it cost to make this movie. This movie was funded primarily through Darren Aronofsky going to his friends and saying, "Hey, give me a hundred dollars, so amazing. I can make a movie." Um, and oh. if the movie does well, you get 150 back. <laughs> and my only response to that was, this dude's got a lot of friends. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's, yeah, that doesn't, I don't know if that math works <laughs> out, but, but sure. Um, uh, I'm sure the vast majority of the money was put up by himself. Like he did as much as he could afford and then, and then went out for the rest. Yeah. Um, a, a very, yeah, you know, like $60,000, a very small film. Um, it's black and white. It's shot gorilla style they did not to save money they did not get any permits so every exterior shot scene is them kind of just going out there and shooting and hoping cops don't come they had a spotter on the crew that was just a guy who was standing there waiting for cops to come so they could hop in a car and and run and get out of there um and i think that reflects in kind of the nature of of what the movie is so yeah, obviously we've talked about Pi before. Uh, that episode, by the way, was January third, twenty twenty. It was our first episode of the new decade. We were we were young, hopeful kids, practically uh-huh. entering entering the new decade. Had no idea what was to come a mere few months later. So, uh, <laughs> so Matt, how was your how was your revisit to Darren Aronofsky's Pi? Uh, what did well, you think of it this time? Yeah, I, I mean, I still think this is a great movie. I, I love this movie. Um, my revisit basically i'm impressed with how sort of simple and clean it is while simultaneously feeling psychedelic and and bizarre like which feels like a contradiction or perhaps sounds like a contradiction but it's like narratively very very streamlined and and focused and clear in what it's saying clear in what its messaging is um and but but because we're in the perspective of this protagonist who is experiencing this sort of mental breakdown and <laughs> halfway mental breakdown, halfway genuine contact with the divine, um, which is you know sort of overwhelming his mind. Um, the 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 uh, the style like it's stylistically distorted, and there's all this disturbing you know disturbing stuff, amazing amazing stuff with like the tone right we've got like the the creepy goo growing on the computer and stuff so like that's mm-hmm. that's a through line i'm just remarking on that because i think he's con- i think aronofsky's consistently really good at making you uncomfortable um with the stuff that he's showing on screen and this is a, a very firm beginning to that since the, the you know the 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 dramatic ending of the movie is the guy puts a drill to his temple which which is i, I think the the image that everyone leaves the theater with in their mind for the rest of their lives. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, just um, I, I once again love this movie. I, it, it, I, I'm always inspired by these stories of some, some, you know, grill filmmaker, new filmmaker making a movie for, for so cheap and then having it be successful. Um, and uh, this just makes me honestly watching this made me excited that we're doing this series. What did you think? Yeah, I think I agree with you on that. I'm I'm very excited to do the series. I mean, the thing I kept thinking about was, of course, this is the guy that made Requiem for a Dream. It's just so like the, the, the stuff he does in this movie are, were clearly templates for things that he does and, and kind of goes crazy with in Requiem for a Dream. Um, the the kind of repetition of sequences of of um, the main character uh, like locking and unlocking the three locks, and we do this very quick cutting repetition of that. Um, the same thing with his popping of the pills. This is this repeated shot that we do multiple times. It's like, oh, this is like the proto example of of how he films the act of taking drugs and getting high um, in these these repetitive, quick bursts of of uh, film shots in Requiem for a Dream. So we'll talk about that more when we get to that movie. Um, I guess the question I had for you here is, you know, you said just this is a pretty simple film. W- what is what is this movie saying? <laughs> yeah, I I think I What is this movie about? I think I know. So I think I didn't necessarily know what like the first time I saw it, the first few times I saw it maybe. So so maybe it's not simple if it didn't if it didn't communicate that to me until the nth time that I watched it, but 
I mean, basically, it's about someone's obsession with understanding the truth of the universe. And you can call that the mathematical pattern underlying everything. You can call that God, you know, the, the true name of God. Um, the, you know, we, we have the finance characters in the film who mm -hmm. don't really care about what it is, but only what they can use for it. And these are all different ways of looking at this question of, of the, 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 this profoundly spiritual, really, um, desire to, to be in contact with something with, with the, the true nature of reality, the divine, the source, um, um, the, the, the secret that underlies everything. And if you understand the secret, then you understand the universe. And, and then it's basically saying with this refrain of when I was a kid, I, I, my mom told me not to stare at the sun. So I did <laughs> that to me is there's a metaphorical representation of you were, you were warned not to try to stare directly into the overpowering majesty that is, you know, this, this divine, whatever it is. And you did it anyway, because that's who this character is. Mm -hmm. And just like the sun burned out his eyes, the number burns out his mind because human humans are not meant to, um, to perceive the divine. We're not, uh, we're not equipped for it. Is is that essentially then like the 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 stance of the movie? In your opinion, is kind of what the Saul character says: is that like some questions cannot be answered, some things we cannot understand, some things you know, even if even if there is a pattern, um, it's not worth it's not worth it to to find it because I I do feel like ultimately that's what the movie is saying. You know, we leave this character at the very end of the movie. Um, you know, she's he's asked a question from the little girl that has been asking him like these math questions that he can solve just using mental math. And at the end of the movie, the answer is, I don't know. Um, yeah. And, and he's, con he seems content with that. He seems content with the idea that the answer to life's questions are, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, something. I, I, I do think so. I mean, I think he, it may even be that he does successfully, um, you know, contain the number. In, in in other words, he he does take on some of the divine by knowing the the name of God, if you will. But like doing that just breaks him and makes him suffer so much that he would rather just not have it, um, so and, and so he gives it up. Does he really drill in his head or is that like this is one thing that's, that that I think is interesting about this movie is you could construct a read of this that everything that happens to him is just kind of in his head and he's just suffering a, a breakdown. Um, I have always interpreted that literally, but I actually agree that the, it's viable to say that he's hallucinating a large amount of this. I mean, I, I think the 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 finance people chasing him around could totally be just a paranoid delusion like there's 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 the one guy who always seems to be following him and then the guy will like disappear and it's clear that the guy was never there mm -hmm. um so he's definitely hallucinating some amount and he could just be having like yeah so there's definitely an interpretation of the movie where like nothing nothing divine or or even particularly interesting is happening we're just watching a man have a mental breakdown yeah um which which is fine i i, I kind of i kind of like the idea that he <laughs> has literally found a name of God and is having a spiritual crisis. And that's what the movie is about. But, but sure, we can take it either way. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it works. I think it functions on either level, but I, I agree with you. I like the interpretation more that like, you know, he's, he's, he's connected into something because it, it means that like the, the conversations with the, the, uh, with the Jewish characters about, you know, he's talking to the rabbi and they're like, you know, like this doesn't belong to you. This is not for you. It's for us. He like God sent us this message and you're just the messenger. And this idea that like, no, 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 like that's, you don't, you haven't earned this. You don't deserve it. And I think it, it's interesting in, in the ways in which the, the religious characters and the, the, um, wall street characters, both after him and the ways in which they differ and con contrast each other, but also the ways in which they compare, right? Because ultimately they both just want to use him to get what they want, whether it's something financial or, or in the, in the religious character, like I think it's, it's the type of thing where their goal is noble. Like they want to understand God better, but they come off as so kind of selfish about it. It's yeah. like, this is, this is for 
us. This is ours. Like this is so we can prove that we are the perfect beings. Um, right. right. It's, wh- while yeah. also not having done anything themselves to actually like achieve that level of perfection. Like if the idea here is that there is, there is this, this hidden name of God. And once you have discovered the name of God, you have, you've become closer to God than ever possible. Then they're kind of cheating <laughs> by just having someone else figure it out and being like, Oh yeah, we got it. It's, it, we got it. We, we didn't do anything ourselves. We just glommed onto this guy. Yeah. It's, it's about ego. And, and like they said, they're like, then we can enter the messianic age. Yeah, based, yeah. Which, which is totally about like wanting. I mean, honestly, it's like, what's the difference between wanting to go into the messianic age and wanting a bunch of money. It's like, the, it's, mm-hmm. it's about material rewards. Whereas yeah, yeah. I think Max genuinely just wants to understand for its own sake, which I think makes him pure in a way that the others aren't. Um, yeah. He, he, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean he's he, he's just interested in the purity of the mathematics, of the numbers, of of the pattern, and you know, therefore he is rewarded. But also at the same time, it is, um. So like we keep seeing the ant, um, and and, and I and I was sort of thinking this. I don't know if I've ever had this thought before before this viewing, but I I kind of identify Max as like the ant, where it's like there's there's a force that he can't possibly understand that is that is acting upon him imposing itself upon him and the you know the 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 number makes as much sense to max as the computer chip makes sense to the ant Mm -hmm. um but but he's he's trying regardless and it's sort of tearing him apart um i i don't i don't know that i quite nailed that down yet in my mind but i i I don't think I ever really understood the 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 ants as, as a as a motif before, and I think I, I for some reason that clicked for me on on this viewing. Yeah, I, th- I hadn't considered that. I was just kind of like, "That's weird." There's bugs everywhere, but <laughs> obviously, this is a movie where where symbols matter a whole bunch. Like, it, what are numbers? But but symbols that represent things, and and we've kind of we're kind of told by the movie that the numbers are just numbers it's it's the context that matters and so everything means something like the fact that the movie opens with him kind of sitting on a bench looking at these leaves um like pondering them and then we we end on that same scene as well um although like i felt like more light was shining through the leaves at the end i Uh, think so I think that was an intentional choice as well. So yeah, it is kind of just a movie that's inviting you to to look at these things as as representing something. And and so I had never considered the ants, but I think that's perfect. That that to to uh, an ant, we are this unknowable. Like we can, they, they, it cannot comprehend our existence. And I think the point is the same thing. You know, with the true the true mysteries of the universe cannot ultimately be solved. Like I, I love I love the use of of go and the game between him him and Saul is like this, this way to demonstrate in a way that's clear to the audience, the fundamental difference between these two people's philosophy that, you know, Saul says there, this is a game that has infinite permutations. There are no two go games are ever the same. And that's not technically true, right? There are, everything's finite. There are a finite number of combinations. It's just so many as to, as to seem infinite. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and and his response to that is no 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 like we can we can we can predict it like it has a pattern there's a pattern to it and the longer you play the 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 less amount of possible combinations there are until eventually it's just there there is no there is no randomness there is no chance it's like this is the only way and he wants to get down to that part and i think ultimately the movie's like you can't you don't understand we we cannot comprehend it enough to actually truly understand that mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's funny because Go at the time was this, you know, almost mystical game. And and this is what this was actually. Yeah, when the I don't remember when the last time we talked, whether Go had been solved by AI yet or not. But it was just an interesting fact that like, you know, Max is, is basically right that that for all of its, you know, intractability in one sense, it's it's solvable by understanding the patterns. That's exactly what the AI does is it understands mm-hmm. the patterns. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would just say, I guess I would just add my my wrinkle there is like, I think I think he succeeds, and and but it's but he decides he doesn't want it anymore is is my actual understanding of of the plot because like mm-hmm. he gets to the point where that like the number is in his in his mind 
and then he's just looking he's looking at the stock ticker and he just knows what the stock prices are going to be yeah um and and uh but but it's it's like it's interesting because i'm not entirely clear other than the headaches what is the problem but like <laughs> I, I i mean like he's kind of he's hallucinating and he's having headaches so is it is it just that is it just a, a, as simple as like yes you 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 got into contact with the divine it gave you a deep understanding of the patterns that underlie your reality but your human brain is simply not equipped to hold this truth and so you're you're physically just falling apart and if you want to survive you're going to have to you know literally give yourself brain damage so that you can go back to being a human and just stare up at the tree and just see a tree instead of seeing like a fractal pattern um is that is that what you understand to be happening yes um essentially i i I think that's what it is is um he is it's it's killing him it's it's literally killing him he's incapable of of fully living like this but i mean it's interesting because i I think you're right the headaches aren't a thing that like starts once he unlocks the number like Mm -hmm. our understanding is the headaches have been a debilitating condition he's had his entire life that you know he he looked at the sun when he was six years old he was blind for a while eventually his vision came back but then the headache started and this has just been a thing and and it's getting worse uh it, it is but but uh it's it's not the headache specifically it's just you know we're kind of told that this thing is killing him and and he decides that it essentially it's not worth it that knowing the mysteries of the universe are not worth it I, I think this is a really interesting choice because one thing this movie does that i never really thought about before and it, it, we don't get the backstory of anyone in this movie yeah like we don't like we don't really even get max's backstory we we like vaguely know that he was a child prod prodigy based on what, what Saul says. Uh, I think he says like PhD at 20. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so that, that's all we know, but like it, it, you would think like in a different movie, because like the one, the one, like I think question that you might have watching this movie is why, like why is Max so obsessed with, with understanding? Is there some core, character trait some core event in his past that led to this need to find the answers to the mysteries of the world um and we don't really ever get that i mean we get we get like the basic understanding from the story with his mom that he is a person that's going to push the envelope that's going to question that's going to not listen to uh, misbehave and and do things that he shouldn't and 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 push things to where he should where he shouldn't but that's it like we there's no like there's no like moment of like uh, I, some horrible event happened to me when I was a kid and I need to understand why that happened. And so I'm just looking for the the answers in, in the universe. We don't get any of that. Yeah. So we're just kind of forced to be like, I don't know, man, he just does. And so I think maybe that's why the question of why he chooses to give it up is more difficult is because we don't know why he wanted it in the first place. Yeah, I think that's true. I think this might be characteristic of aronofsky just to some degree that we that they're they're almost more impressionistic and poetic stories that Mm -hmm. that rely a lot less on traditional elements of narrative like telling you the backstory and and the concrete motivations yeah Um, i i guess i guess i feel like we're just meant to understand that's just who this guy is and it doesn't doesn't really matter why i think uh, i will say this viewing i feel like this was a new revelation to me because I, I feel like one thing that's just changed over time is I just like noticed that everything is purposeful, right? We talked about this recently, actually. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about his neighbor, Devi, and how he'll frequently, usually before he's about to like push the button on the machine, he'll start either hearing or hallucinating that he hears like sex happening through his wall. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And God, like this is one of those things where I don't want to believe that I didn't notice this before because it makes me feel dumb, but it's entirely possible I never noticed before that like he's just clearly in love might be too strong a word, but he's clearly lusting after his neighbor yeah. and and uh so particularly like the timing of those moments where he's hallucinating this and then the fact that that he hallucinates her at the end 
where he, he's just hugging her. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, I think what she represents is just him having something like a normal life, him just being yeah. a man, him just being a human and um, enjoying, you know, the, the mundane, the physical, the just sex and, and normalcy. And, yeah. and then he, he's it, it's like that's tempting him and then he rips himself away from it and he goes back into this world of, of numbers and, and trying to get the code and, and he and um and i think so that the, the fact that that he, that he sees that hallucination of her at the very end i think that's for me that just kind of clicked together really nicely and i was like oh this is him like just realizing that he he can either be a man or he can like transcend which is the same as dying and he's and he chooses to be a man um and, yeah and that's and that that like fit together really nicely for me in a way where in the past it had it had felt kind of chaotic and almost like you know avant-garde like chaotic images and i'm like no no this is not it, while this movie may not be clear it is not avant-garde it is it is thoughtful or maybe it is avant-garde the point is everything has a purpose yeah and it's cleverly put together and very tightly put together. And I think I just, you know, previous times I watched it, I, I wasn't watching it as as a sophisticated viewer, perhaps. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I think this is a guy that closes himself off from the world, right? We get this recurring image of the three the three deadbolts on his door. Why does he have three deadbolts on his door? Because he doesn't want people around like yeah, he yeah. he he goes to move outside like to, to leave his door and the first thing he does is look out the the keyhole or the the peephole to make sure there's no one out there and if he sees someone out there he pauses and stops and waits until they leave to go out there um he's constantly annoyed by people wanting to interact with him the only relationship he has is with his mentor um and then the end of the movie is him sitting on that same park bench and and he but he's sitting with the little girl this time so yeah. he's you know and for the first time in the movie her asking him to do this trick of his uh, doesn't annoy him mm-hmm. like he seems genuinely like satisfied with her asking the question and and delighting in his ability to say i don't know um and yeah. he seems happy and and one thing like we we talked about the mirror image shots of of him looking up at the trees at the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie. And I think one thing we haven't really talked about the performances, but one, the actor who plays Max, Sean uh, Gallet, who's also one of the, the writers and a friend of Aronofsky's, he plays it really well because you can tell in the first scene, he's looking at those leaves inquisitively in like, here's a thing, here's nature. And I want to understand this. I, I, want, I need to know this. And I just feel like the way he plays it at the end, it, it, he, he, he has just this, this look of content, like just contentment yeah. on his face where he's not looking at nature and the, the, this kind of beautiful image of the sun, like shining through these leaves. And he's not looking at it. Like I need to understand why this is and what this is. It's just like, that's pretty. Yeah. yeah I like that. Yeah, he's just appreciating reality instead of looking for the pattern behind it. I think I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Yes, I, I agree with you. The, it's it's actually you could view it as a tale of enlightenment, like as mm-hmm. a as a positive tale of enlightenment, where it's like a, you know, um, you you the, the the journey of the enlightened one is is to um, try to peer behind the curtain of reality and then end up in a place where it's just reality, like. There's there's nothing behind reality. You're just seeing reality clearly. Yeah. And um you you no longer have magical powers to predict the stock market, but that was that was never what you really wanted. You just like you 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 just want to be able to look at the world and appreciate the beauty of it without necessarily needing to know the magical number that that uh, lies behind it. Um, yeah. It, it's, it is an interesting kind of exercise because there are versions of the story that are like, I need to know the answers to the, the mysteries of the world. And then the lesson is, no, you don't. And you need to, you need to resign yourself and be satisfied with the fact that you don't, you will never know the answers. And, and, and as, as you said, this is a movie where he, he solves it. He does find the, he finds the number, he gets the number, he memorizes the number and, and takes it in. The mysteries of the world have unfolded before him. And he still, at the end of the day, says, I don't need this, actually. Um, yeah. I, I feel like I'll be it, it will it will be better for me and for the world if we don't have this. 
Yeah. Because um, it clearly didn't bring him any happiness, right? It's just, yeah. It, it yeah. in fact just made him actively miserable. Um, it did. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the directing of this a little bit because uh, we've been focusing most on the story, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, but this is, this is a very special stylistic film um as we said this is black and white um it is it is shot in high contrast as well which means these the differences between the blacks and the whites really really shine like you kind of get drowned out by the white a little bit um it, I, I, we talked about it it's shot gorilla style which means a lot of it is handheld i think the place where this is most uh obvious is the chase sequence <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. uh, in the, in the, when, you know, we're basically running through a convenience store um, with a handheld camera and you can almost barely tell what's going on. Um, it, it's just, it's very distinct in the way it looks, the way it feels. It, the film is very grainy. This is shot on 16 millimeter film. And it's shot. I know we, this is one thing I know we talked about last time. I'm going to say it again. Uh, this is to save money there's a there's certain film you know where you shoot on a negative and then you develop the film based off the negative you you develop a positive based off the negative right yeah uh, this was shot just directly <laughs> directly on a positive um which is it's cheaper because you don't have to develop but it's also it's also a lot a lot of work <laughs> um because you, you, like i, I just you end up with more film overall, I think, um, because like if you shoot, you know, you shoot on a negative and then you only have to develop like you shoot a bunch and like, oh, I, I thought about it. We don't need like all the, these takes. Well, let's not let's not take the time to develop those takes. We look at the negative and be like, ah, we don't need those. You shoot on a positive. You have everything. <laughs> so there was like so much film shot for this movie. Like I actually read that, you know, the production costs were sixty thousand dollars, but post production to edit and and score and and release this film cost another sixty thousand dollars yeah to do all that um so uh, all that being said very distinct style i'm wondering kind of what what stood out to you this time about uh how aronofsky chose to shoot this movie yeah well i mean the, I, I guess what you just said about it being like super grainy and and this very sort of high contrast black and white is mm-hmm. something that we don't see him return to as far as i can recall um, but I thought it worked really well. I thought it was a really cool choice for the movie. Um, yeah, essentially the type of thing that's not really a choice, but is a choice. Like yeah. it's, it's not a choice in that black and white film is just cheaper. So that's what they used. Right. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, it ends up working to the advantage of the movie. Yeah. I mean, I feel like he shoots it in a way with the, with the lighting and everything that makes it seem really stark and iconic. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. you know i I think i don't think the action stuff works very well like this is this is really my only criticism of the movie because i just i really think this is a great movie but the the chase scene it's it's too confusing it's kind of silly um there's a moment when the woman like hits him and there's like a comical slapstick you know pow sound um and and i i just kind of was like i don't think the movie needed this i don't think it adds anything to it um that was that was my one my one criticism and i was on i was kind of thinking like like this this feels like a like almost an afterthought relative to the sort of mannered coherency of the rest of the movie we just had to have an action scene i don't know if you feel the same about the action scene um yeah i mean it's like it, it, it's a thing that didn't feel necessary to me um like and, and it's interesting you know you look at you look at the the movies Aronofsky goes on to make and none of these movies really have big action sequences right. in them. I mean, like the wrestler has wrestling <laughs> um, and and uh, Noah, I guess, has some big Noah, I think, is like just money wise, probably the biggest movie he made. Um, yeah, but like the the fountain, the fountain has fi- fighting, but like my, my recollection of it is that it like feels like a fairy tale like it doesn't mm-hmm. feel like he's even trying to do it realistically yeah um i agree i mean i think there are there, there are like interesting things we we cut co- when we cover these first movies uh, of directors the first movie is almost always the most interesting one because it is the one that like defines who they are as a, a filmmaker and and it's 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 very rare that like you would go oh the first film that that person ever made is like is clearly their best work 
and, and that's kind of how I feel about Pi, where I like this movie a lot. Um, I find it really intriguing and, and entertaining to watch, but it is, in my mind, clearly a first film. Yeah. And stuff like that. And, and it's not and I'm not talking just about like it's it's a, a movie that didn't cost a lot of money. Like, yes, it, it looks like a film that's cheap, cheaply made. But I don't mean that in a bad way because it's stylistic and it, it works for the movie. But it's stuff like the action sequence where it's like, I wonder if if Aronofsky in 2024 would say, I mean, the movie doesn't need this part. Like, yeah. like there, there's enough there's enough surrealism and there's enough frantic cutting and, and, and frantic imagery in, in sequences that fit the tone and style of the movie more that we don't need to do a chase sequence through a, a, a deli. Um, which I wonder, like speaking of guerrilla filmmaking, like I wonder if they literally just like <laughs> sprinted into a random store, uh, like a random bodega in, in New York City. Entirely and, uh, possible. I love this idea. <laughs> um, it, and just it, part yeah. of the reason they were running is because they had to get out of there before they called the cops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that would make me like it more, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, just to compare it against Black Swan again, like that's a movie where that that film, based on my memory, at least just sticks to this tone of like horrible dread and, mm-hmm. and doesn't I mean, there's like a small moment of violence at that in that film that I can recall, but it doesn't it, it's almost it almost gives you a sort of release when there's action because it's like, oh, action, there, this is a movie. <laughs> but like um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to move on from talking about this because it's it's like it's really not a thing that makes the movie worse. It's just like I I kind of agree. Like, I don't think he would have put this in the movie if he were doing it um, later in his career. I think it would have just yeah. been not there. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's worth talking about, though, because I think it does is like. It, it defines a director that is still kind of working on managing tone a little bit. I think, I think, I think it is just objectively true. Even if the movies as a whole, you might like a little bit less that later films in his career, he has a better handle on managing kind of what the tone is like throughout and uh-huh. the consistency of like, even, even if the filmmaking is surreal and you're never quite sure what's happening and what's going on, which is a, a, a just a true through line in all his work. Um, he manages it a lot better. Like yeah. the consistency of it is just better. And, and it's because he's a young filmmaker. This is his first feature film. He's written, he did some student films and some short films and that's all he's done until this. And, and it is, is pretty remarkable that like he has as clear of a vision as he does. Like this is, this is such a, like just like taking a step back. This is such a cool thing to be like, this is what I want my first film to be. Yeah. Is I want it to be this particular thing. And it says so much about him as a filmmaker is, I am going to make this this essentially student film um, that is my exploration of obsession. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and I'm going to film it in this way. I have these ideas for how I'm going to do these things. And like these, you know, I like that you said avant garde, like just the choice to do this thing with I, I, that, I can't get over the locks. Like this is the thing that stood out to me the most on this rewatch is the repetition of the locking and unlocking the door. Yeah. And how like distinct and powerful of an image that is that's so yeah it's funny so like i haven't watched a lot of student films it's not a thing that i've done but th- there, there's something very um student film feeling about this movie but like that's almost like the the, the superpower of aronofsky is he is he does these affected things things that you know, stylistic choices one could almost call pretentious if they didn't work mm-hmm. so well and he makes them work, <laughs> you know, like that, that's, that's what I love about him because I, I think I even know people who, who don't like, for example, um, Black Swan or Requiem for a Dream and, and mm-hmm. the, 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 because they're, because these are like these narrative lists, um, meditations on, um, you know, dread and anxiety, and 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 uh, they're they're sort of just torturing you. They're sort of just making you feel bad for ninety minutes. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I think that's great. Like he's he's doing a different <laughs> thing than what everybody else is doing, and he makes it work. He makes it appealing. Actually, like it's like I don't feel like I have to be like, oh yes, I am one of the special people who appreciates black swan it's like no yeah. that, that's a well-liked movie people actually like aronofsky he he makes these 
he makes very different sorts of movies. And that, it's not that I, I say narrative list. It's like, it's not that they don't have narratives. It's, it's that he's really, really unconstrained by typical filmmaking conventions of narrative. Like what's the narrative of the fountain? Well, we'll get there. But like some of these movies, the narrative is very, is, is very, um, secondary second that's perfect it's a perfect word secondary to what we're doing with the characters and and maybe even just like the the, the feeling the tone um yeah. and i yeah i, 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 I appreciate think, that yeah I, I think you're right and i think this this creates this early interesting dynamic with aronofsky where the feelings i have when i watch his movies and and i think pie this happens with for me as well is i don't feel i don't feel emotion for the characters if you know what i mean yeah um like I, I it's it's not like it's not like i'm sad or happy or concerned about max as a as a as a character right. but i think what aronofsky is so good at is getting you to feel um uncomfortable <laughs> um get, getting like it, it's not necessarily that he it, it, he's not making you feel things i'm not saying this is like like my complaints about ridley scott and his robotic characters at the times this is more He's so good at making you feel uh, discomfort, feel overwhelmed, feel discombobulated. Like he, he's really good at using the visual language to make you feel stuff that isn't just, oh, I'm sad because this character's sad. You know, we talk about movies as an empathy machine and it, it's not that Aronofsky is not doing that, but I very rarely feel empathetic towards the characters in an Aronofsky film. I just feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And and this is a movie that that I think like the, the headache sequences in this film are so effective. Like one of the things when I sat down to watch this movie, one of the things I remembered about it is this guy, this guy has really debilitating headaches. And like uh, the thing I remember saying to myself, and I think I was being a little stuck up and pretentious is like, this guy really needs to make me understand what it's like to have these headaches or none of this is going to work on me. I don't know why I thought I had this thought while pressing play on the movie, but I did. And then I was almost immediately like, okay, check. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> because like yeah. his use of sound, his use of editing, like everything he chooses to do with these headaches are like, yeah, I get, I totally, I'm not feeling the pain this character's feeling, but I'm feeling discomfort to the level of, I get, how overwhelming this must be for him yeah um I, i'm there and and he's really really good at that he's yeah. really good at that yeah I, I think he he knows exactly how to escalate things so that they actually connect like as a person who gets headaches um i'm rarely uh stumbling around like screaming and like punching the mirror mm -hmm. but but that's kind of how you feel in, yeah, yeah. In, 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 in your mind. So like if it's like that that feel like simultaneously feels very accurate while not actually being accurate in like a journalistic sense of what what it actually looks like. Um, and I think that's that's I think he achieves that with Requiem, Requiem for a Dream, too, where he's he's capturing the feeling of things without necessarily being too concerned about the reality of them um yeah and just in yeah just in general i it's it's so interesting right it's i, I i'm increasingly <laughs> glad that we're covering aronofsky because i feel like we've said this before you and i are just naturally attracted to thinking and talking about narrative and analyzing character mm -hmm. in a somewhat traditional way but we also both appreciate this kind of thing we just have we just have less experience talking about it you could say so i'm mm -hmm. really going to enjoy going through this because ho hopefully we figure out ways to talk about it yeah I, I, i'm very i'm very curious about like so do you kind of agree with what i'm saying here about like uh, like i was just i never felt sad for max i guess is the way to it. like and it's not like i didn't understand like technically that oh this guy's going through this stuff that sucks. Um, I hope he figures it out and I want him to be content. Like I, f I felt those things, but I didn't like feel them emotionally. Do you know what I mean? I like, do. I, it, it's just interesting that, you know, I, I tend to like directors that would make me feel that, that like, and, and we'll call it traditional, like traditional narrative structure that like that, that the point of this movie is, you know, 
when it, when the character dies at the end, I'm going to be real sad about it to the point where I get a little choked up. Um, I don't, I don't, and I'm thinking about his other movies as well. Like characters in Aronofsky films go through some shit like, right? Like it is, it is horrible, emotional, often tragic. And I don't always feel the emotions for that in the way like you would in a traditional narrative. Um, Yeah. I think there's, there's a distance um, imposed by the way he does, by by the stylistic choices he makes. And I feel like it's intentional. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing about Max in this movie is that he's, he, he is just sort of unlikable. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, he like never smiles. He's rude even to his mentor who's like his only friend. He's rude to his neighbor who shows him kindness. Um, like what, like what is there to like about the guy on, on one level, but also we empathize with him because we watch him struggle and it's just natural. But, but I, I, I agree with you. Like it's more like your, it's more like a sort of cl- clinical view of, of this character. Um, and I think, I think he trends in that direction. Um, I wish I had better language to describe what this is versus what what you're what you're talking about is like um using empathy to make you uh relate to the protagonist. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think we're really <laughs> often asked to relate to Max. We're we're meant to understand Max. We're meant to um uh we're meant to see into his mind to the degree required to understand why he makes the choices that he makes. Yeah. But I don't think that we're meant to um, identify with him and, you know, f- feel like, ah, yes, that, that is me. <laughs> right. Which is, which is, I think, I think a thing that, that is often achieved in movies where you almost feel like you're, you are like merged with the movie and the, the things, the things that are happening, the characters are sort of happening to you emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and those are like uh, those are the, the movies I typically like more, and and I think it's in- so interesting the way that Aronofsky is not interested in that kind of storytelling at all, and yet I still just deeply love these movies. Um, like oh. I, th- I think I- I'm going to go ahead and state here at the beginning that the, I consider The Fountain my favorite of his films, and I'm kind of curious to see if that's going to change over the course of this thing. Um, I'm also really interested to talk about what we're talking about with with empathy and how he uses empathy and, and ca- concern for character because the, the final film that we're be covering is the whale, which is a movie I haven't seen and don't know a lot about. However, I do know it's the story of like a, 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 a severely obese man and his struggle, you know, and if it, it feels like in my estimation, a movie in which having direct empathy and relating to the character would be very important to the story being told there. So I'm, 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 in, I'm interested in like, if, this is a thing that's going to be a through line of all his pictures and, and, or might s- like subtly change, or we're going to end up looking at the whale as a kind of a major, if not stylistic departure, narrative departure mm-hmm. for Aronofsky. I don't know. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I also think there's a, I don't know if spectrum is the right word because spectrum implies there are two poles, whereas the, this might be, there might be more going on that I haven't quite broken down in my mind yet. But like, mm-hmm. I think of, I, I was, as we were sitting here, I was trying to think of like, who else does this thing that we're talking about? And the first thing that jumped to mind is Kubrick, where I hmm. always feel this incredible distance from Kubrick's characters um, while understanding them completely. Like, I understand why... Um, uh, what's the, the... Barry Lyndon. I understand why Barry Lyndon makes the choices Barry Lyndon makes, but I almost at no point in that movie feel anything like empathy or, or like connection or, or identification with that character. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and I say that's true of, of really any Kubrick movie I can easily think of. Um, I think people, you know, famously the most relatable and human character in his movies is Hal 9,000. Um, <laughs> um, Cause you actually, you actually feel bad for Hal when they're pulling his brain apart. Um mm-hmm. you know, Whereas you don't necessarily feel bad for Bowman at any point, right? Um, so, so I don't, I don't actually know that Aronofsky goes as far in that direction as Kubrick does. Like, like I, th- I think I felt empathy for the characters in Requiem for a Dream. I think I feel an empathy for Hugh Jackman's character in The Fountain. It'll be interesting. I haven't seen these movies in forever. Maybe we'll watch them, and I'll be like, 
no, I don't actually. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just I, I I'm fascinated by this though. I'm glad we're I'm glad we're kind of mentioning it now, so it's something we can keep in mind as we go forward. Yeah, I agree because you know the, the Fountain is a movie about how to deal with the death of a loved one, and yeah, that feels like something where we would need to have a, a severe amount of empathy for him. Um, so I I. Oh, this, he's such a fascinating director, man. Like this list of movies is, is, you know, I think we're going to find similarities. Of course we always do, but I, I also think it's going to be really interesting seeing these are very different types of movies. Like the wrestler is a very different type of movie than Requiem for a dream. And, uh, and I know that's one of the ones you haven't yeah. seen, so you don't have anything to grab onto there, but, but it's true. Like it, it's, it's, he he's, you know, one of the things we discovered with Ridley Scott, and and that was a much longer series because he had directed so many more movies, is that he just like was kind of a chameleon type of director. Yeah. Where he just did different things. And I think I think Aronofsky is less of that. I think Aronofsky has a more distinct visual style. Um, but I also think he is searching for different things in his movies. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean so, the wrestler. The, yeah. I've 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 seen the trailer of the wrestler enough to know that it, it seems more like a straightforward drama from the yeah. from the trailer mm-hmm. at least. Um, so, I, and it's been too long since I've seen it to remember if it has the kind of frantic, surreal, fast cutting, uh, almost like you know automatic <laughs> automatic weapon type filmmaking yeah. uh, that that so many of other movies have. So I, I don't I don't remember. So I'm 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 looking forward to revisit the wrestler is one that I've only seen one time. And it's been I think it was when it came out, which is many, many years ago now. So I'm looking forward to it. like I'm this is I'm legitimately super excited about this series. And I think the pie is like the perfect one to start with. We had seen it before, so it's not like it, it's not like a Wachowski situation where we both had seen hadn't seen their first film ever and we're just like holy shit holy shit holy shit it, it, it was all here it was all here from the beginning this is more of just like a a confirmation that this guy is excellent a reminding ourselves of how how assured he was at the very beginning and and anxious anxious to get into more yeah absolutely yeah i guess just final thing that occurs to me is you just said the machine gun you know style and it's like yeah this this movie, the, the camera is so incredibly active, um, almost to a degree that's overwhelming. And mm-hmm. and and I remember, I remember watching. I actually remember watching Requiem for a Dream for the first time. Um, and I remember it being overwhelming. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to forget. It's hard to forget yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah. Like it's so. It, it's it's this barrage of cuts. I, I feel like I've got. I feel like I've watched so many movies at this point that I'm not going to be overwhelmed by it like I was the first time. But it was. It's so different from any movie you've seen if you've had like a normal life up to that mm-hmm. point. Um. And uh, uh, in this movie, yeah, like like think about just like basic stuff. Like he's using the computer, right? And it's like these like fast close zoom in cuts to the button as his finger smashes the button, and then like uncomfortably close close up to his face and then we like see him through the glass case of the computer with the chip hanging in the middle in focus and we cut back to the keyboard and it's just like bam 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 yeah and um that's um that's characteristic of him i think i think yeah yeah yeah. for for, i think you know we'll get into requiem for a dream in, in a couple weeks but just as an example the average film of the length of this movie and Requiem for a Dream has about 600 to 700 cuts uh-huh. in the movie. Requiem for a Dream has 2,000, uh-huh. more than 2,000. So, yeah, this is something that at least early in his career, he was very, very, very into. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that changes uh, over the course of it. Because I don't, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember, like, I, I know... I know Black Swan is like very stylistic and very Aronofsky, but I don't remember if it's stylistic in that kind of hip hop montage cutting thing that he does. I don't. Yeah, I um, I don't remember either. I don't remember. I'm looking no, we'll forward find to out. Yeah. We will find out. Uh, right. This is great. This is great. What a great start. Pie, if you haven't checked it out yet for some reason, I think is a movie worth your time. Um, it's 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 good. It's just good. It's just enjoyable. It really is. Yeah. All right, so we will move on next to Requiem for a Dream. That will be uh, the next Aronofsky film 
uh, that we will cover. We're not going to do that next week. We're taking a, a slight diversion to do something else extremely important, which is talk about the video game Elden Ring. So that's what we're doing next week. Uh, but we will we will get back on the Aronofsky train after that for Requiem for a Dream. Yep. Elden Ring is a long time coming. So It is. Matt has been absolutely begging me to play this game. Uh, how long ago did it come out? Uh, since then, essentially. Yeah, right. S- years, right? Years. <laughs> do, 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 do. Doof. Uh, all right. Before we go, though, Matt, uh, we did ha- have results for um, Poltergeist. Now, f- you, if you will recall, uh, said yep. no to yep. this movie being in the canon. Uh, I think I think that makes me the minority report. Yes. Yeah. Um, for for a second there, I thought you were going to almost be the only one. <laughs> uh, but at the very last minute, uh, at least one other person voted no. Uh, so at, for a vote of 96 to 4 percent, the it was it was nearly unanimous. Uh, Poltergeist is officially in the Doof canon. Congratulations to those those damn ghosts. They're in. Yeah. It's interesting. It was an interesting conversation for me, and I, I've now that now that there's been some space and time since I watched the movie and since we talked about it, I think the problem was like I had seen the movie so long ago mm-hmm. that I just remembered it being different, and then when I watched it, it was you know it was a movie from the eighties, kind of corny. <laughs> Yeah. kind of dated in various ways quite slow and i was and and i was disappointed i was actually disappointed because i was like this isn't what i remembered like i would have voted for the movie that i remembered to go into the canon but i wasn't i don't think that's a fair way of approaching something um yeah uh, I, I think one kind of kind of consistent comment we got from people about this movie was you know, this is the movie that introduced me to horror as a child. I watched this movie when I was 10 and it scared the shit out of me. You know, this is, uh, I, I was seven. It was legitimately months until I w- it was able to sleep. And, and that's all really interesting because I don't think I got even close to being scared at one point during this watch. Right. And I know like watching stuff as kids is a very different experience. I don't think this movie is very scary, but I bet I would have if I was seven, seven years old when I watched it. Yeah. I I watched it as a as a kid. I don't remember how old I was actually, and I think the tree scene did scare me. And I agree mm-hmm. with you that watching the tree scene now did not scare me at all, or, or even yeah, not at all. Um, I think I don't know. I, this is just interesting. I, I wonder. I, I I honestly wonder. Um, was this a movie that was scary to adults when it came out? Because yeah, you and I have been you know, our brains have been reshaped by like, <laughs> like w- what, what is the maximum capability of scariness of films that has been innovated over the years? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so may- maybe, maybe if we, if you and I were just now watching it for the first time and it was 1980 or whatever, then it would have felt different. I don't know. I I find this a fascinating question, but I have no way of answering it, honestly. Yeah, I wonder if like the truest the truest thing about this movie is just it's a it's a horror movie for children, and it's like which would be perfect for the Steven Spielberg of it all is that this is just a scary movie that was technically made for kids. Um, now I don't know if that's entirely true because there's a lot of complex stuff happening in this movie that we talked about last week, but you know it seems like it was most effective poor people when they were children Mm -hmm. well okay actually that's that you you just pinged me to to have a thought so like jurassic park has a lot of similarities with this movie um and it's in this following specific way that it has a brother and sister central um um kid characters that a lot of the like fear centers around the same is also true in jurassic park where the the two kids are constantly getting into terrible situations. We've got the scene in the kitchen with the raptors um, and the T-Rex with the car. Uh, and yet there's also adult themes and boring dialogue scenes for grownups to enjoy. <laughs> um, and and like sort of like interestingly deep debates about like the nature of the thing, you know, either debating about like the morality of cloning dinosaurs or, and, and science or like having interesting conversations about the nature of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I will say Jurassic park 
still has still 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 has some of the most effective sequences of any movie i've ever seen <laughs> yeah. with no no caveat of looks pretty good for the early 90s it's just amazing whereas this movie i think that is not true of this movie yeah uh, it's almost not a fair comparison <laughs> it's you're comparing it to one of the greatest movies of all time so that's true yeah <laughs> that's true um no, I think this is all true. Uh, one thing I did want to highlight is is uh, our listener, Pear Jane, commented on, you know, we didn't talk about the mother very much in this movie um, in, in our conversation last week. Mm -hmm. And one thing that she commented on is, you know, there's a lot of the fear in this movie is based on the fear of, you know, kids stuff like the, the tree and clowns and, and that kind of thing. But w one of the through lines of fear in this movie is parents losing their children and and you know i i kind of regret that like one of the sequences we really didn't talk about at all that jane mentions here is um the the moment where she feels carol ann like move through her body and this like is, is almost broken by it and you know that's really interesting because we, we both we both have children right and we both talked a long time about that that fear of of losing your children in because so many so many of the things we read or watch circle around that central fear that as i think a, a shared fear of all parents is the fear of losing your, ch your child and it is interesting to me that that part of the film didn't stick out to me enough that i felt really a strong desire to bring that up in our conversation yeah because it's definitely part of the movie totally agree like it, it just didn't I guess it just didn't dramatically affect me all that much, honestly. Yeah, which, me neither. Which me is, either. I mean, yet again, I, I, I more or less stand by my position that I don't think it belongs in the canon. I'm mainly just saying that I was being too hard on it. Um, <laughs> but I still don't like, like you just said, you, you literally just said it's unfair to compare it against Jurassic Park, one of the greatest movies of all time. And it's like, yes, that's true, but that's what the canon is supposed to be for. <laughs> so. So we're just acknowledging that it's not one of the greatest movies of all time. So anyway, but yeah, I, I agree that like like the the idea of um of losing a child. I mean, I think that's that's well dramatized, but but we're we're so caught up in just like the fun of the mystery or the and and the the supernatural that it doesn't doesn't really um it doesn't really weigh on you the way it might um if it were kind of a more like like like. like uh what's what's i can't think of a good example right now but i'm thinking like the, the the babadook or something where it's like such a like slow quiet movie and you mm -hmm. really dwell in like the loss and depression of the character like that's the movie whereas this movie like yeah your characters are experiencing this loss but you're you're actually dramatically focused on um the actual like fun parts of the movie <laughs> Like, yeah uh, that's interesting i, I kind of want to rewatch the movie with with all the stuff in mind and and see if i can kind of unlock this more for myself because yeah. I, i'm agreeing with everything you say and and I, and I really do enjoy the movie i voted yes on it i think it's a very very fun movie but yeah it just didn't affect me in the way jody's saying it yeah. did for her uh which I, I find really interesting because I, I like I can see it. I can see why someone would watch this movie at, from the perspective of a parent and just be very locked in on like the absolute terror it is to your just your child's gone. And like you can hear her in your house calling out to her, but you can't get to her. And like that is that is a core emotional part of the movie. That's a, a big part of the climax, right, is is her going into this world and, and rescuing her kid. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just like from from an emotional standpoint, like the terror of that really didn't get to me yeah. at all. I think one reason we didn't talk about it much is we were talking about the metaphor. And t to me, like the metaphor that there is something like, you know, your kid is, is sucked into the TV metaphorically. Like you, <laughs> you your kid is still in the okay, house, yeah. but they can't hear you because they're sucked into the TV <laughs> because they're watching too much TV and you've lost, you've, you've lost your child, not literally, like you haven't literally lost your child, but you have lost touch with your child because they have been pulled into the, the, the world of, of television, that insidious mm -hmm. beast again. And, um, and for me, like that was the, the most, um, 
most interesting thing that we that, that I enjoyed talking about with you. So maybe that's maybe why we didn't talk about it so much. Yeah, um, yeah, that could be. That could be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, regardless of what you think or what the other couple people that agreed with you think, <laughs> uh, Poltergeist is now officially in the Doof canon. It will be the 31st movie to enter our illustrious canon. It's got a lot of good company here, Matt. Well, good good for it. <laughs> <laughs> You started this conversation saying, I think I was too hard on this movie. And then you came back, you came back around to, it doesn't deserve it. Get out of here. I, I mean, I think both things, land. I think both things are true. I think I, I was like actively disappointed the whole time I was watching the movie. Cause I was like, man, I remembered this being so much better. Um, and, but, but like, that's that's not that's not a fair way to watch a movie i I think that's just true but but also i don't think i'm wrong about any of the specific things that i've said here sure sure that's fair that is fair and that is going to do it for us this week if you have any further opinions about the movie poltergeist or you just want to talk about darren aronofsky and pie you can reach out to us feel free to email us at doofmedia at gmail.com over on twitter at doofmedia or on our subreddit r slash doofmedia that's right. And if you are not already subscribed to the Doofcast, then please go ahead and do that. You can find us on any of the podcasting platforms. Yeah. You know what? I think it still technically says iTunes, YouTube, and Google Play. Pretty sure this one doesn't exist anymore either. Yeah. So uh, we're they're dropping like flies. Yeah, they are. They are. That's but and 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 at the same time, like all these little no name services, they like just crawl the Apple podcast index and then put your podcast on their service without you having to do anything. So, uh-huh. <laughs> so just, just do whatever it's, it's everywhere. It's amazing. If you Google any of our shows, uh-huh. how many services I've never heard of yeah. are just like, here's the latest episode of, of Kingslingers. Yeah. It's like, who are you? Right. They're probably putting ads in our show without our permission for all we know. Yeah. If you ever hear an ad in any of our shows, uh, we're not doing yeah, that. Yeah, we've never done that. Yeah. So someone's doing something bad. So yeah, let us know. If you're listening to our podcast on uh let me just Google. Let's see <laughs> let's see what comes up here. They have the silliest names, don't they? Uh-huh. Um yeah, this one's called Spotify. Weird. <laughs> never heard of that one. We got Pod Bay. We got Pod Friend. Yeah. Pod Chaser, <laughs> Pod Bean. Pod- pod bean we got listen pod news listen notes raphonic <laughs> <laughs> what are these you've got a creator profile on on pod chaser pod paradise congratulations <laughs> this is wild this is this is wild nz.radio.net <laughs> yeah so so go subscribe on all of those platforms please <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, and again, if you ha- if you see any ads, let us know, and we'll <laughs> chase them down and find out how to get our show off them. That's right. I mean, I honestly don't care unless unless they're like putting shit in the middle of our podcast. Right. Then that's what I get mad. If they're knowing, if they're doing that, then just know that you can listen to us literally anywhere else and <laughs> not have that. All right. Well, you can find all of our our shows over at if you ever just want to listen to our shows, just just clear, like just head to doofmedia.com. They're all there. Uh (laughs) There's no ads in them. That's right. And if you want to support us, please consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. You can head on over to patreon.com slash Doof Media and pledge at any of the available levels. Matt and I are currently working our way through the Stephen King rough adaptation called castle rock we've got a new episode of that coming out next week so you don't want to miss that and all the other episodes we've done so yeah subscribe join join up join the party join the party we're we're all there and you know on quibbler and nubler and (laughs) spot pod and all those places go ahead and give us a a five-star rating and a review or seven thumbs up or whatever it is they do over there um because really really uh, helps us out thank you quibbler and noobler yeah this seemed like reasonable names to me Uh uh-huh quibbler and noobler and spot pod (laughs) yep
patent pending tr- trademark. <laughs> oh my god! All right, folks, that's gonna do it for us. The uh, next week, as we said, Elden Ring. We're gonna have a video game episode. Y'all like video games? We're gonna do one of them. That's so we'll, right. be, we'll be talking about our time with the brand new hit game Elden Ring. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be a good one. Uh, we have lots to say about this game, about how it tells stories, about uh, its design, and uh, and and why it's uh, the worst game of all time. <laughs> Uh, now they're gonna listen matt yeah i tricked him i tricked him it's a good trick we'll see you next week my name is doof and you'll do what i say my name is doof and you'll do what i say